You're listening to And hey, you're listening to Books and Boba, a book club and podcast featuring books by Asian and Asian American authors. My name is Marvin Yu. And I'm Rira Yu. And we are here to discuss our May 2024 book club pick, Kill Her Twice by Stacey Lee, a YA murder mystery noir taking place in 1930s Chinatown. Super excited to get into this book with you, Rira. As always, Books and Boba is supported in part by our listeners at patreon.com slash books and boba. Uh, so if you'd like to become a bigger part of our book club, um, head on over. Patreon supporters gain access to not only our members-only Discord server, uh, but also monthly bonus podcasts. So definitely appreciate everyone who supported us so far. Um, Yeah. Stacey Lee, I'm glad we finally got to read one of her books. I feel like she's been on our like TBR list since the inception of our podcast. Yeah. uh, So Stacey Lee is the OG queen of Chinese American historical fiction. Um, Her like she's known for Under a Painted Sky and Outrun the Moon, which, you know, takes place in like Chinatown in San Francisco. Um, Her more recent books are The Downstairs Girl, which takes place in like I think Savannah, I don't know which part of Georgia, but like it's Georgia and you have a Chinese American girl and it's like, whoa, that's a setting that I'm not used to seeing Asian people in. Uh, So it's really cool that she has been kind of keeping up with this canon of (laughs) of like building up her catalog of Chinese American history. Yeah, so without further ado, let's get into discussing Stacey's latest novel. Um, as always, um, our book club discussions will cover the entirety of the book, including all plot-related twists and spoilers. So if you don't want to be spoiled on this murder mystery, now is your cue to hit pause and finish the book before coming back and listening to the rest of our discussion. So with that spoiler warning out of the way, um, Reba, as always, can you start us off with the book jacket description of Kill Her Twice by Stacey Lee? All right. Los Angeles, 1932. Lulu Wong, star of the silver screen and the pride of Chinatown, has a face known to practically anyone, especially to the Chow sisters, May, Gemma, and Peony, Lulu's former classmates and neighbors. So the girls instantly know it's Lulu whose body they discover one morning in an out-of-the-way stable, far from the Beverly Hills mansion where she moved once her fame skyrocketed. The sisters suspect Lulu's death is the result of foul play, but the LAPD, known for being corrupt to the core, doesn't seem motivated to investigate. Even worse, there are signs that point to the possibility of a police cover-up, and powerful forces in the city want to frame the killing as evidence that Chinatown is a den of iniquity and crime. Even more reason, it should be demolished to make room for the construction of a new railway depot, Union Station. Worried that neither the police nor papers will treat a Chinese girl fairly, no matter how famous and wealthy, the sisters set out to solve their friend's murder themselves and maybe save their neighborhood in the bargain. But with Lulu's killer still on the loose, the girl's investigation just might put them square in the crosshairs of a cold-blooded killer. Yeah, so... You know, I've been saying this all all month when we've been um, teasing this book, but this story definitely has like it checks off a lot of the boxes that I personally look for in a story. Uh, maybe not in this combination, but I'm really glad that it's all there. Right. Um, Chinese American history, noir, murder mystery. There's even themes of like the power of representation and soft power. Like the murder mystery itself is kind of a combination of a cozy and a noir. Um, but Stacy also mixes in some YA coming of age in there. And I think it's like, personally speaking, it's balanced really well. What do you think? Yeah, I think it's balanced pretty well, too. And it's pretty obvious that this is your pick for the month because (laughs) it, 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 like you said, it checks a lot of boxes for you. Um, I think it's like for the people who are expecting this book to be like a really uh, like nail biting whodunit book, I think you will be disappointed because it's such a mix of genres. And um, and because it kind of mixes in noir with cozy, it's not going to be one or the other. So, like, I feel like it blends the two quite well. But obviously, if you're like a fan of like hardcore noir fiction where you could kind of like follow along and figure out how to put the clues together, I don't think this is the book for you. But I had a I had an amazing time reading <laughs> this. So, yeah, I mean, I think noir itself 
in noir stories, the murder, the crime itself is never really the central point of um, the story, of the mystery, right? It's it's what drives the mystery along. But noir stories tend to be more interested in uncovering, you know, the corruption all around us, right? Whether it's like the corrupt politician, merchants, law enforcement officers. And, you know, the central investigator is usually like a hardball detective who's cynical to the world, uh, but with a strong moral compass. So they stop at nothing to uncover the truth. And... You know, the uncovering of the truth behind the crime is what noir stories are really good at exploring. Um, whereas in my experience, cozy mysteries tend to take more inspiration from like classic detective fiction, like your Agatha Christie's, right? Where a mysterious murder happens and an investigator comes and unravels like the puzzle box determining, you know, the novel way this person was killed and who That's did it. That's not really what I describe cozy to be. B. That just sounds like more like straightforward murder mystery. Well, I mean, the difference between them is with the cozy mystery, right? Usually the investigator is not a professional. It's just not like, it's yeah, not like, it, you know, it's a an Poirot amateur. Coming. It's like an amateur yeah. and it's more small time. It's less about like the grand machinations for like the perfect murder. It's it's more domestic, you know, it's like more small town murder, like you yeah, said. But and, cozies um, are still, in my opinion, solving the murder is still like the central point of the story, like figuring out how they did it, who did it, um, and the characters along the way. Yeah, I mean, for me, like cozy mysteries are usually... Like the murder actually takes the back seat in terms of like mystery solving. Maybe it's because the uh, detective in that scenario is an amateur sleuth, but um, it's more about like the environment, most mostly about like um, the people who are in that community. I feel like it's more of like a character story and like a more of like an environment, like a uh, like a story that like really puts the setting as like the main, I guess, presentation. I like I I don't know how to talk today. <laughs> um, so like an example would be Mimi Lee gets a clue, which we've read uh, for book club by Jennifer J. Chow, and it's about a woman who is trying to run her Los Angeles pet grooming shop. So it's like about pets and about <laughs> uh, trying to solve a murder where like she she is inadvertently like pulled into. So that's kind of like what I see cozy to be. Whereas like, for example, like Sherlock Holmes and Poirot, those are very different. Like, Yeah. I guess I'm just saying in terms of like the structure of a cozy is much more closer to a traditional detective novel than. Oh say, yeah. Like, it noir, is much right? closer to a traditional than noir, but yeah. yeah like I, I just want to say those, those <laughs> three, those three are very different from each other. And Stacy kind of mixes in cozy with noir, noir because it's like about corruption of the LAPD and politics with like Chinatown and the greater Los Angeles uh, city. And then you have the cozy part, which is like you get like the Chinatown vibes and you get like family issues and coming of age. And that's more in the cozy area. Yeah. And our main characters, May and Gemma, aren't necessarily hard-boiled detectives, but they are somewhat cynical, right? Because of their experiences as like Chinese American women growing up in both like a very racist society and also as women in a patriarchal society. Yeah. I mean, funny thing, uh, maybe it's because um, like the title of the movie, but I immediately thought of Chinatown. Uh, the movie directed by Roman Polanski. And it's like, oh, that also takes place in the 1930s, even though the film was made in like the 1970s. And that is also about corruption of the LAPD. And 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 like the th- there's that famous line, right? Forget it, Jack. It's Chinatown. <laughs> and it's, you know, it's very derogatory towards Chinatown. And that is a different Chinatown than the actual Chinatown that people grew up in in our community yeah and also this story actually takes place and is about chinatown and is not made by a child molester yes yes um but aside from that point uh yeah. but like that is like what came up in my mind when i first picked up the book i was like oh we're actually going into chinatown <laughs> and it's not the chinatown that we live we're familiar with because uh, this is old chinatown this is the chinatown that was built before Union Station came and replaced it. It was a little sad to read that one of the central conflicts of the book is that the building of Union Station is going to displace half of Chinatown. Um, Because as people who live in Los Angeles, um, I mean, to me at least, Union Station has always been there. 
And I knew tangentially that like it was built over old Chinatown, but to kind of go in and read the experiences of people who were actually personally affected by the building of like this essentially public good, right? Like it's going to be good for the city of Los Angeles, but not good for the communities, especially the Chinatown community. And one of our patrons actually um, brought this up in their Goodreads comment, um, Nina, who wrote that um, she really enjoyed that this book was a way to learn more about what it was like to live in the time period and what issues they faced at the time, kind of how like some people enjoyed The Great Gatsby. Um, For example, the development of Union Station in LA Chinatown was particularly interesting uh, because I've noticed a lot of cities tend to build major transportation infrastructure in or near Chinatowns. Um, South Station and the highway infrastructure in Boston took out half of Chinatown there. And in Seattle, they're currently discussing plans to take out multiple blocks of the International District for a light rail station. Our desire to improve city infrastructure usually comes at a cost of the most impoverished people within these cities. And it's totally true, right? Like, I think what I love most about noir mysteries, there's a reason why post and pre-war L.A. is such a prime setting for these stories. It's because L.A. is a city that exploded in growth during that period. And with growth comes the, you know, the opportunity for corruption, right? Who gets to build these things? Where do we build them? Who do we build over? And the people that make the decisions and who gets affected by the decisions are like the best fodder for like noir mysteries. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, you know, it's kind of sad because the Chinatown in Los Angeles now, new Chinatown, a lot of it has been diminished because of gentrification. So, you know, like reading this book while like knowing what happened to old Chinatown and like knowing what new Chinatown looks like and new Chinatown doesn't look like (laughs) when it like first opened, obviously. Um, Yeah, it was kind of sad to read. But at the same time, like, I think it was it made for a more immersive read. Um, I'm pretty sure it's different for people who don't live in L.A. and don't really know some of the history. But um, as someone who, you know, lives in this city, uh, it was it was really interesting. It it was like a deep dive into history. And I think Stacey Lee, uh, the queen of historical fiction in Chinese American history, uh, she did a really good job. And I heard in an interview that she's actually from L.A. Like her family, you know, they live in the same house. And, you know, she grew up hearing a lot about like the changes that went into the Chinese American community. So you could definitely see her research into the topic here. Yeah, I mean, something that isn't really said outright in the story is 1930s exclusion was still the law of the land during that time. Like, Chinese Exclusion Act didn't get repealed until 1943. Yes, and it's before World War II. So, yeah. Um, it's, during, it's during the Great Depression, and I I forgot, like, was it someone in our, in our Discord? I don't remember, but someone... Maybe it was a review that I read, but someone said like, oh, I didn't feel like it was in the Great Depression because um, we're like so focused on like the local politics of like Chinatown and like this railroad station trying to be built. And I'm like, hmm, I wonder because like the Great Depression in the West Coast, I'm not really quite familiar. I do know that Hollywood still thrived under the Great Depression. So I don't know. I mean, at the same time, though, the specter of poverty and like financial ruin. I mean, you get it in the in the fringes. Yeah. I mean, it was ever present in all the characters, especially the Chinatown characters, right? Like about businesses closing down, being vandalized, whether or not they can make rent by selling flowers. I mean, that's the reason why Gemma was always trying to grift, right? Trying to trying to go to places that Chinese people shouldn't go to to sell flowers at higher prices. Yeah, I think I think like a common question was. Oh, like a flower business still being in business during the Great Depression. That sounds a little bit odd, but I'm like, it's Hollywood. There are so many rich people here. Of course, they're going to freaking buy flowers. Um, they're throwing all so, those grand parties, right? All those like prohibition yeah. era parties. Like, I think the thing with historical fiction sometimes, it's, it's hard to read and not try to like map those times to our times, right? Our values to their values. But Signs of the depression are were everywhere. The, the the child's flower supplier was closing shop, right? So they were stressing about where were they going to get their flowers? How are they going to compete with other flower dealers, right? Like, you know, in the flower market, they had like a, a white flower seller that was selling to all the big parties that they know they could never get those customers, right? Yeah, yeah. And also they were like talking about how, like talking about food all the time too. It's like, oh, like people in our in our neighborhood, they're like watering down their porridge. Like we're 
you know, we're lucky to even have rice and vegetables because, you know, meat is so hard to come by. And it's like, okay, you have like little signs of uh, poverty here and there. And also like the fact that May is always like uh, sewing and altering their clothes so that they look presentable because clothing is expensive. So you do see signs of poverty and Great Depression, but... And I do appreciate um, that Stacey didn't dwell on it, right? I think... Yeah, because, yeah, same here. You know, just because you're poor doesn't mean you're thinking about being poor all the time, right? You're thinking about living. Yeah, and also there's that st- statistic about like uh, like high heels and lipstick sales going, going up when we're in like an economic recession. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, people want to look good. Because everything is shit in their <laughs> life. So it totally makes sense to me that uh, Gemma would like invest in lipstick. And, you know, it it works out because in the opening chapter, they go to Westlake Park and they're like, we have to look, you know, we have to look presentable. We have to look pretty because that's like the way we're going to get customers. And I'm like, <laughs> you're right. Get your bag. Like, <laughs> yeah. What did you think about our, our main characters, May and Gemma? I definitely related to May more as like an older child and like arguably the more responsible of my siblings. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely the elder sibling. So I related to May more, but I actually had more fun reading Gemma's POV because uh, I feel like she just brought so much uh, spontaneity and chaos to it. And I'm just like, yes, I love chaos. I don't want chaos in my life, but I like reading about chaos. <laughs> she was definitely and, a chaos child. I did love that Stacey wrote her dialogue and thought patterns in like in patter, right? Like she spoke like a character in like a noir film or like a, a My Girl Friday, right? That sort of fast paced speech pattern. Yeah, yeah. And also just I listened to this book on audiobook for like half the time and uh, there is different voice actors for uh, May and Gemma's voice. And I was like, yes, like, <laughs> it totally makes sense. You can tell like how different they are as sisters. And also I kind of got sense and sensibility vibes because you have one sister who is like very like practical, all about like supporting her family and thinking about other people. And then you have the younger sister who's just like, I want to have a life full of adventure and romance and gets herself into trouble with all of her schemes. But I love the fact that Gemma is like such an entrepreneur. (laughs) Yeah. And I love the idea that they went to Westlake Park and they're like, we're going to quadruple our prices. And May's like, what are you doing? That's not (laughs) That's not ethical. And she's like, they're rich white people. They won't know the difference. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's funny because like she says it's not ethical, but then like everyone else is doing it. Like, how do you think rich people got rich? Right. Yeah. And also, like, is it ethical? Like, is it non ethical when you are forced to uh, sell at the city market because you can't get permits anywhere else? I'm like, that's unethical. I mean, <laughs> that's discrimination. Get your bag. Like I said. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, throughout most of the story, May is very much said in like, this is the best we can do. This is the best we can hope for. So let's just do the best um, at what we're allowed to do. And Gemma is definitely the more like, why can't we? Why can't we aim for the stars? Why can't we go to these places where people are willing to pay four times the price and sell it to them? Yeah, um, actually, there's a line that Gemma says to May that I wrote down. You think keeping us safe means walking inside the lines, but I have news for you. The lines aren't keeping us safe. They're keeping us locked up. Very, very true. Yeah, I I really enjoyed like, you know, we'll get to the mystery part because we haven't even gotten to talking about the murder mystery investigation. But the um, the coming of age story of like May and Gemma, really fun to read. Like, you know, we've seen a lot of this type of Asian American coming of age, right? About like wanting to pursue something creative, wanting to break out of the box, wanting to, you know, like be more than just what your family expects you to be. Um, but I really enjoyed seeing it in like the 1930s, right? Especially 1930s Chinatown. Um, Maze. I really enjoyed Mays. Um, I didn't expect the fake dating storyline, but I was yeah, I'm me glad too. It was that there. was a pleasant surprise. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And Gemma had her own, you know, romance side plot, kind of like the enemies to uh, not quite lovers because they they don't get together in the end because of um, you know, a reasons. But um, a lot of our readers on Discord expressed that some of their favorite parts of the book was the the romantic side plots that were going on during the investigation. Yeah, I did too. I re- I surprisingly like the uh, fake dating trope in this book. Totally did not expect it. 
Um, uh, Wallace the Bug Boy, like I thought he was hilarious. I kind of wish he had a bigger part in this book, a uh, bigger part in helping solve the murder because uh, we find out later on that I mean we got Chekhov, Red Die like, had yeah. to do <laughs> with with the murder. Uh, so I kind of wish he was in in the murder solving part more. I really like Frederick Winter. Um, even though he was complicit in the murder <laughs> at the at the very I guess he wasn't like totally complicit, but he was like tied to right? yeah. yeah, he yeah, he was compromised. And I'm like, I really like how um, you know, he is like he just like can't stay away. He's like, <laughs> why <laughs> like he's he's so he's nosy. strong he's to like, this chaos ball that is Gemma. And yeah, he's just like, why are you selling here? Was well, like, why is why are the flowers like quadruple the price? And it's like, why are you it's like, why do you need the payphone? Like, don't you have a car? And then he just <laughs> keeps getting like more involved in the in the uh murder solving, in the crime solving. And I'm like, I love it. Um I know people were a little bit sad that that romance didn't get its that resolution. That they weren't endgame. <laughs> Endgame, but I, I liked how it was kind of like open ended. You know, it's just like, yeah, his his reputation got ruined, and now he has to start over. But like, we don't really. I mean, like, he'll be Gemma fine. can still keep in contact with him. I don't know. I mean, like, he'll be fine. He's a white guy in. He's the a 30s. doctor who's a white guy in the thirties. I mean, he's World War Two isn't just around the corner. Um, so well, maybe he'll die in the war. Who knows? Um, but. <laughs> It was a little like this is what I was thinking of when they were engaging in their relationship, which is like at this point in time, that's illegal, right? Like, oh, yeah, it is 100 (laughs) percent illegal. And um, this is this is the part of like history that I really enjoy because I I love film history. So uh, this book takes place in 1932 and uh, Lulu Wong is inspired by Anime Wong. Mm -hmm. Uh, Anime Wong was um, what is it? Her 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 uh chinese name was louis louis song wong so it's like kind of like i think lulu wong's uh name was like similar i yeah and i was just like (laughs) oh right 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 um but anime wong like she was the first leading um not leading she was like the first asian american starlet in in hollywood so during the silent era and into the talkies um she was you know, very prolific in the Chinese American community. She uh, advocated for the community. She like was very vocal about politics in in like the height of her career. And you can see similarities with uh, Lulu and Anna in terms in, in those terms. And I really like the fact that you know she like acting was kind of considered a less than desirable. Uh, profession in a lot of conservative spaces, especially the Chinese, the traditional Chinese American families who are like, oh, actresses are like hussies. I mean, it kind of but, still is. I've, I've heard a lot of my actor friends whose parents still think that way. That's so weird. Because um, <laughs> I'm just like, they're making bank and like they're supporting your family. I feel like that's something to be proud of. Um, but yeah, like you see like May is also like a theater kid and she's friends with Lulu Wong and uh, May didn't take the chances that Lulu took. She didn't audition, even though she's very talented because she knows that her family will disapprove. She knows that um, I guess like her place is being the reasonable one in the family. Cause it's like, Oh, who's going to take care of who's going to rein in Gemma's like, chaotic plans like who's going to take care of mom and ba who is in the sanatorium and um it's just like yeah that's a lot of burden to have as the eldest sibling who you know kind of has to be a role model for the younger siblings and um yeah i thought that was interesting with film history uh we're in like the 1930s this is when uh, anime wong's career was starting to take off um, I believe that she started starring in movies in like 1922. I think that was like her first leading role. Um, and there's like, like I really love that we are in like this anime Wong renaissance because I feel like there's been like more books and documentaries about her uh, coming out. But yeah, we existed. We <laughs> had um, even before anime Wong, we had uh, Sashue Hayakawa and we had Philip Bond and. 
you know, like we were present in in Hollywood, even though um, we got underpaid and got screwed. Yeah, but only in certain ways, right? Like I think Anna Mae Wong has famously boasted that like she like died a thousand times on the screen. Yeah, I mean, she was known for her like villain villainous roles and like Chinese stereotype, like Yellow Peril uh, roles, which she absolutely freaking hated. And, you know, when she got, like, more influence in her career, she was like, I don't want to do these roles anymore. And that's why she went to, like, Europe, because there was more opportunity there. Um, And you see Lulu, who is also, like, very sick of doing these roles where she's playing the villain. But that is the only thing available to her at this time. Yeah, and that leads into one of the – so I guess we should – Talk about the murder investigation because that is the bulk of this story. I really did appreciate, like, I felt like the novel was paced really well. Like, every single chapter, we advanced the investigation, looking at leads, uncovering red herrings. And, you know, one of the threads was, was Lulu murdered because of this new film that she was starring in, right? Like, a big plot point is that Lulu's newest film is the first one where she's playing the heroine, not the the villain or the, the yellow peril. And that was going to ruffle some feathers. So, like, was that the reason that she was killed? Um, it ended up being a red herring. Um, but I did appreciate that this led us to the storyline where May infiltrates the production and inadvertently becomes the lead actress. Yeah, yeah. I actually wish that came earlier on in the book with May, like, uh, becoming an extra on <laughs> on the film. Like, I, feel, I felt like that came a little bit too late for, for my taste, but... Um, to each their own. I mean, um, but the I actually reason... thought that the investigation was paced really well. Um, I thought, you know, every chapter they were chasing down a new thread, advancing the investigation and ruling out red herrings. And I thought it progressed in a pretty logical manner, right? Like the Hollywood angle was something that they were always trying to chase down, but they didn't get the opportunity to until, um, you know, this this book has two main climax set pieces, both set during like big fancy parties. And in the first set piece where they infiltrate like a big gala thrown by the newspaper, that's where May was able to make contact with Lulu's co-star, Hetty, and get brought in to become an extra for the film they're working on. Yeah, I, I mean, like pacing to each their own. I, I just kind of wish that I came earlier so that we got May like living in this alternate life that, uh, you know, Lulu had. I, I wish we just like had more time with her um, kind of like enjoying this life that she could have had because uh, I felt like it was it came a little bit too late and we spent too short of a time and it's like boom she got casted as like the the leading lady and it's just like oh wow that was really fast um, but the reason why this book is called Killer Twice it's because of this line in the book and it was it was bad enough that someone had killed her. A second death would come in the form of a scandal. Her twisted body held up for viewing like some circus sideshow. Her fame recast as a cautionary tale. They would kill her twice. And yeah, like we said that this is a, this is a book that kind of mixes noir with cozy. And, you know, like Lulu was kind of seen as the face of Chinatown. And with her gone, it's like, okay, well, now because her body was discovered in Chinatown, it gives an opening for the city council to be like, oh, look, see, like a grisly murder happened here. Chinatown is not safe. And like, we should definitely tear it down <laughs> to for the greater good, right? So well, not that's kind of where we get the Well, politics. not necessarily city council. It's this um, Otis Fox, who is the, um, like a makeup mogul who is pushing the city council to close Chinatown and citing this as one of the myriad reasons why they should do it. But the thing is like corruption is everywhere. Like they've had, uh, they have like, they had like a incident where they paid off the jury for, uh, for like a proposal that the city had um, proposed. They had, uh, you have Gemma and May paying off bribes to like police officers and they say this is just the way in LA you have to sweeten the pot a little and I'm like yeah (laughs) um corruption is everywhere (laughs) and you know like you also see why they're worried that the murder is never going to be solved because like immediately with like detective malady he doesn't want to be there and he's just like okay well like she was an actress. She was famous, right? Probably a boyfriend did it. 
okay, case yeah. closed. And it's like, I mean, you didn't even freaking try. Man. Yeah. And we also see this like coming together of people with power, um, even if they don't agree um, on the reasons, like if their interests align, they're willing to work with each other, right? Like the, the newspaper mogul, uh, Mr. News, he has a beef against the train companies because his wife died in an accident caused by the trains. And so he wants Union Station to be built in order to, you know, stick it to the train companies and making them pay for a project that would cost them millions. And that goal aligns with Otis Fox's vendetta against Chinatown, right? Because he wants Union Station to be built in part because he wants um, Chinatown to be, you know, demolished. And so while he doesn't have a personal beef against Chinatown, he's willing to pay off Detective Malady to cover up Lulu's uh, murder investigation in order to advance his own agenda against the train companies. And it was kind of, like, it was funny and sad to learn the reason why Otis Fox has a beef against Chinatown and it turning out to be because he was not seated right away when he went to um, Cash Louis' restaurant. Uh, yeah, I mean, it tracks. What and a petty reason, right? What a petty reason, but, um, you know, it tracks for his character. <laughs> uh, one of the other red herrings that we follow that ends up not being not being the reason is, like, there's, like, a mysterious woman and, like, these oranges. And I thought that was a really fun diversion, too, because it gave us a really... I guess bittersweet line, which is like as they're investigating like these. So basically, one of the threads is that a mysterious woman delivered uh, mandarin oranges to Lulu right before she was murdered, and they find there these are very specific, out of season mandarin oranges that only a few people know how to grow at this point in time. And there's this one line when they're um, asking questions to um, I think it's Mr. Takashi, who is the the fruit vendor at the city market. And after answering their questions, he like also makes a comment that like, man, I really hope Roosevelt wins. I really like that guy. Um, not knowing that in like five years, Roosevelt's going to sign the order to like probably send him to an internment camp. Oh, God. Yeah. In terms of like red herrings, I felt like there were a lot. And uh, I, feel, this book was very much like, like Gemma, like running towards danger and being like red herring. Okay, dead end, red herring, dead end, <laughs> dead end, dead end, dead end. And I feel like towards the end, it was just like all kind of like dumb luck that they ended up where they were. <laughs> and it, it, this is definitely not one of those mysteries you could solve, in my opinion, because I feel like there was like too much information that was kind of left off page for for us to like come to the conclusion that it was... Uh, like Otis Fox's wife, who was the murderer, because it's like, whoa, where did that come <laughs> from? Like that, that was that was a lot. And I totally did not expect um, the lipstick to be the murder weapon, like it being like an allergic reaction. I was like, huh, interesting way to die. N could have never guessed this. I don't know how I feel about it. Maybe my pride has been hurt. But the interesting thing is that clue was there right from the start, right? They noticed that her lips had like an unusual shade and was unusually puckered, right? Yeah. And like the clues were all there. And, you know, initially when I got to the solution of the mystery, I kind of felt like out of all the threads that they were following, this was probably the least interesting one. Um, because some of the other threads had like a sense of conspiracy behind it. So, you know, I think I was looking for like a noir-ish solution. But, you know, the more I think about it, the more I actually do like that the reason that Lulu Wang was murdered was just good old fashioned racism, right? Like the mother-in-law just could not fathom her son being in a relationship with a Chinese woman and decides to take matters into her own hands because like, you know, for a rich white woman with power, this was the one thing that she could not stand. It makes sense, right? Because in this time period, the reason why like a Chinese person or Asian person would be murdered was most likely because of racism, right? Like they were somewhere they weren't supposed to be. Um, they were with someone they weren't supposed to be with or someone just needed to take their anger out on like a personal consequence. And so the fact that the truth wasn't this grand conspiracy, um, it wasn't like someone trying to cover up a truth or cover up a crime, but it was just like one woman's racism. It, it actually does make a lot yeah, of sense. Yeah, yeah. I'm. I, I am glad that her murder was not a result of like a passionate crime, you know, like it wasn't her boyfriend who turned out to be Philip Fox and uh, Philip Fox actually was a decent guy. He like actually freaking hates his dad and wants to create change. And I'm like, okay, well, we'll see how long that lasts. But um, 
like I do like the fact that he wasn't the killer and like you said the cause like the reason for it was just good old fashioned racism um but I also like the fact that she like like the the killer was was a woman because it's like oh like that was not suspected but at the same time I'm just like I kind of wish we got more of her in the book because she kind of just popped up out of nowhere and it's like huh I kind of wish that the killer was kind of more there in in the background because it just kind of seemed like too much of a surprise at the I end. actually didn't mind that I think because of the fact that like the reason why Luan was killed wasn't some grand conspiracy and wasn't like because of her being in the wrong place at the wrong time or uncovering a truth that they needed to be covered up. It was much simpler than that, right? And because the reason was so simple, I don't think we really needed more time with this killer, right? Like, I don't think learning her, the backstory of this person who, like, hates Chinese people um, would have added more to to the mystery. I mean, like we said, there's a lot of red herrings. Um, like, Gemma and Maid are like, oh, was it a jealous... Uh like Chinese extra? Was it uh, Hetty, the co-star? Was it Carrie, the leading man in the movie that Lulu Wang was supposed to be in? Was it Lulu's agent who was trying to trying to get a Cadillac sold slash transferred to his name, and he like quickly replaced uh, Lulu with a, another girl? Like I was just like, there, there's a lot of red herrings, and I don't know if I enjoyed all of them. Because I felt like they kind of just stopped so abruptly. I, I kind of wish we followed like her agent a little bit more because I was like, oh, that is a suspect that is like pretty. Um, I mean, I feel like that would have caused the story to drag a little, right? Because you know, every chapter they were investigating something. And, you know, even if it turned out to be a red herring, it would lead to like another clue in the case in that thread. And I feel like every thread got its own wrap-up, right? We found the solution and it wasn't a murderer, but we find out something new about the world, about the characters. And even in the chapters that turn out to be red herrings, we do get good like character moments, right? Like we get interactions between the sisters, interaction between May and her fake boyfriend. I, I, I understand those chapters were important because they were doing other things. And I do enjoy the other things in those chapters. I'm just saying that in terms of red herrings, I, I felt like they could have gone a little bit further in making us suspect the suspects longer because it was just they had so many suspects and I don't know they were just kind of being pulled all over in different directions and I was like huh I kind of wish it was uh, streamlined a little bit more but like you said it's more about like you know the world and the relationships that's that's where the cozy mystery comes in i mean also also noir right they're they're exposing corruption the mechanisms of power behind the world as well um and i kind of feel like i mean that's how these investigations go right you're chasing down your leads and checking off which ones don't pan out and i don't know for me it was i like the pacing that they went i like that i didn't think there were too many red herrings um but I mean, that's also, that's also just personal taste, I think, right? Yeah, again, personal taste. Um, I have to say, like, in terms of, um, like, the world and, like, character, I liked May's arc the most out of this book. Um, I like the, like, I don't know, there's something just really therapeutic about someone who is, like, a perpetual people pleaser, who is always putting other people's needs above their own and, you know, are so grounded and not willing to chase their dreams and all of a sudden they're just like okay like like I'm allowed to be selfish I am allowed to dream of things outside the con- confines of like my environment and it's like yeah I love the fact that like May you know she she got to be selfish and she got to you know um explore her horizons more and of course like I loved reading Gemma more. I like I like reading her voice more, but I have to say I like May's uh, character arc and growth more in the book. Yeah, I think she has the most. Like she grows the most, right? I don't I don't think Gemma necessarily grows as a character. She you know she's still just as reckless from the start as at the end. Maybe even more reckless <laughs> towards the end. But May definitely goes through like a transformation of like having more resolve and what she needs to do to protect her family and community. I also really like their youngest sister, Peony. 
uh, as like the resident Miss Marple fan, <laughs> kind of being like the, um, you know, she didn't have as big of a part uh, because they, she wasn't allowed to go on investigations. But um, it was kind of fun to see her as like kind of the home base. She's like the the secretary at the detective agency who's like, I don't know, giving like advice. Yeah, I do like how she's just like, I am the most uh, like. I am the most intelligent out of us three. <laughs> I know, like, I know how to actually investigate crimes. Why do I have to stay home? And, you know, it's her ideas that get May and Gemma, like, being like, okay, maybe we should go check out this place and investigate. Or maybe we should talk to these people to investigate. And it's just like, yeah, Peony, brain of the operation. Freaking love <laughs> it. Also, Miss Marple series, it's brand new in this time period because it came out the first miss marple book came out in 1930 and this yeah. book takes place in 1932 <laughs> and i'm like oh peony you're ahead of the curve look at you trendsetter <laughs> yeah i did enjoy the depiction of chinatown the chinese community um cash Louis was great uh, mr yam um do you want to talk about no good mr ing who um is your resident chauvinist Man, fuck of- that guy <laughs> yeah like seriously. him being like oh it's it's the fault of it's it's your fault because your family has three girls and that's like bad fortune for the entirety of Chinatown. And I'm like, listen, man, like, what are you fucking talking about? Also, it's the guy. It's the man that determines the sex of <laughs> the babies, uh, you know, like with, with the chromosomes and whatnot. So I'm just like, it's actually the guy's fault. But, you know, like this is before they discovered like all of all of that scientific <laughs> nonsense. Um, Not that that matters to someone like Mister Ng, and definitely Stacy Lee also hates No Good uh, because yeah. he has the most like petty backstory too. Like he's like this terrible man because the girl that he loved rejected him in favor of Guitar Man, who is like the community homeless man who like everyone kind of loves slash tolerates. Um, I thought he had a really cool story. His story is part of the Mandarin Orange Red Herring, where um, the mysterious woman turns out to be his long lost daughter. And he's also caught up because he's the one that he becomes the person that the cops decide to pin Lou's murder on. So um, yeah, adding yeah. An, an extra layer of like, we need to solve the murder to not only save Chinatown and bring justice to Lulu, but also to you know, prevent um, Guitar Man from going to jail. Yeah. I mean, this is random. Like, I just, like, thought of this um, about how, like, Lulu, like, her new film was, like, you know, she was kind of the force behind it. She was like, I'm going to play the leading lady. We're going to not make this, like, super stereotypical. Um, We're going to give some depth to our Asian characters, make sure that there is a little bit of empathy there. And um, she and there were kissing scenes in the script. And it that was like a big deal because of the anti miscegenation uh, laws because you couldn't have interracial interracial couples kissing on screen and this also went for white actors who would tape up their eyelids as long as they were uh, portraying an Asian character <laughs> they could not kiss another white character which is super ridiculous and this is during the Hayes Code as well so <laughs> so a lot of rules when it came to um and t- in, when it came to filmmaking and it did make me question like uh at, after i finished the book i was like huh we never got the answer to the script stealing uh oh i thought they mystery. did that. was that, that was, Susie, it Daisy? Was Susie Daisy like yeah. the, the was it extra. was it like explicitly said or it wasn't explicitly said but i think all signs we kind point of, to yeah her we just kind like, of yeah. assume that it's her okay got it cuz that's what i assumed too i was like because remember, Do May I calls remember her cousin that? in Fresno, and she's like, "Yeah, that girl's crazy." She's yeah, like, that girl's crazy. That girl is like <laughs> a diva, right? Like she's a she's a pathological liar, which makes sense that she went into acting. And I'm like, "Oh, okay, she's one of those people." Okay, <laughs> yeah. So going back to more reader feedback, um, this one also comes from Nina, who we quoted earlier in the episode. Um, she caveats his comment saying that she's not a huge fan of whodunits and that this wasn't the right book for her overall main mental mindset, but decided to power through anyways. Um, she writes, I think it's hard for me to give an objective review for books that aren't my preferred genre. I spent a lot of the book trying to suspend my judgment of the fact that these girls were so lucky to get all the information that they ended up with and to be in the right rooms despite the background of them not being privileged people. 
And, you know, first of all, thank you for reading along with us, even though murder mysteries aren't your thing. Um, I will say, I mean, when it comes to, you know, being in the right place at the right time and looking at the clues, I feel like on one hand, that's par for the course for like mysteries, right? Like your your investigators needs to be somehow on the right track and get like the, the right things. I don't necessarily buy that. It was unbelievable that they were in these situations um, because I feel like back in the 1930s, Chinese people were seen as a labor class, right? They were laundromat people, restaurant people, they're working the gardening. And so one thing that is true now as before is like people don't pay attention to the help, right? People don't pay attention to the labor. Um, and so it wasn't so unbelievable that they were able to get into like these situations unseen. Yeah, they would sneak into galas as and pretending to be workers. Like even at the Otis Fox's uh, premiere party, um, I mean, May is able to go in with all audacity because she is now like a movie star of the um, <laughs> rival film. But you have Gemma who works in the kitchen because it's just it, yeah. it's a very easy way to blend in. And I'm like, yeah, like um, there's luck to it, obviously, because, you know, they get caught several times, <laughs> but they manage to, you know, smooth talk their way out of it. But um I think I think in terms of like, okay, this is where they found the clues. Um, I think it is quite believable. Um, and you know, they are they are lucky girls because I was pleasantly surprised by how accepting their dad was, even though he's like in the sanatorium. Um, he's not like super present throughout the book, but you know that he loves his daughters. And even though like having a son is like a priority in uh, Chinese families. He's like, I love my girls. Like all three of them, when they work together, they're able to do anything. They're unstoppable. Um, they each have like their own um, skill and beauty that like, you know, makes them stand out. And um, I also love the fact that the baby, like uh, once once <laughs> their mom has a baby, it, it was another girl. And I was like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, He's Take a girl dad. That. <laughs> yeah, he's a total girl dad and I love it. And it's so rare. And um, yeah, they were very, very lucky in that regard. Yeah, um, I did. Like the one part that I did feel a little like, huh, this is a little too lucky was when Gemma snuck into the morgue um to like get oh yeah with like for like, the autopsy report yeah. <laughs> um but then I did like that Stacy did sew up that plot hole by saying oh Detective Kid was a sympathizer, right? Yeah, Detective Kid totally saw her and he was just like, okay, well, like, you know, I, I'm not like those other cops. <laughs> I'm not like other cops. I I actually want to be on the side of justice for once. And I also do like the fact that she got the autopsy report partly due to her using uh, Frederick's name being like, oh, yeah, Dr. Frederick Winter. And I love how that kind of like comes back to like bite her in the ass <laughs> Him being yeah. like, uh, did you forget that I used to work at the morgue? And um, and him being like, oh, I like, by the way, I did like I, I redid the autopsy and was like, whoa, you didn't have to do that. <laughs> but thanks. <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, I did like that. You know, she used the fact that he was the hot doctor for her own purposes. I thought that was really funny. As soon as he said he was a doctor, I'm just like, you're going to be using that man left <laughs> and right. Like get like get him to do all the medical investigation because you always need at least one doctor <laughs> or one mortician. In, in a team of crime solvers. Yeah, I, I like them together, even though he was like, I was throughout the book, he did seem very sus. Like I, I was like not 100% sold on his like goodwill, right? Yeah, yeah, same here. I, I was just like, oh, is he a suspect? It would be pretty <laughs> cool if he was the suspect. Um, but I also did like the fact that he, you know, he was like a decent person or, you know, trying to do the right thing when, he knew that he uh, was on the right side of of history, I guess. Yeah. Um, so one of our other comments that we got was from a couple of Jen. This was on Discord. Um, she wrote that she does enjoy cozy mysteries. She likes the contrast of a serious situation mixed with comedy, making it a lighthearted story. Um, so her suspension of disbelief wasn't too fragile um, because she doesn't mind the formulas. Uh, for her, a good murder mystery 
is enough to pique her curiosity and consider who done it, but she doesn't actually like guessing the ending. Um, a weird push and pull where she's not trying to spoil it for herself. Um, I have this problem too, um, where I like sometimes I just need to like no right like um or sometimes i just like subconsciously accidentally spoil it for myself and when i'm like you know looking up like this happens a lot in, when i'm watching tv shows where like i want to know what's happening um so i'm like reading you know like wikipedia entries or like um or commentary and then inadvertently i happen upon a spoiler and like just like mess things up for myself yeah a couple of also said uh they were worried that frederick was going to be a villain and <laughs> was relieved that uh he wasn't and i'm like yeah yeah funny how i cheered for a white man love interest uh, <laughs> i mean maybe Gemma could, could change him right like he, i can fix him i can change him i mean he definitely wasn't like a raging racist right he definitely saw he, he was a privileged white man but he definitely saw Gemma for who she was which was which was nice um it's nice to have a book where like not everyone is like Super racist. Hostile, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, even um, the uh, the owner of the steakhouse that ends up being like the the lead of like the anti corruption squad or grand jury, he turned out to be a pretty cool dude who like was friends with Cash Louie and said like, oh, the only reason why Cash Louie doesn't have a restaurant empire like him is because Otis Fox hates him for not serving him. Yeah, and I do like the fact that uh, he would like quote verses from the Bible being like, it's totally okay for us to do this undercover operation because God (laughs) says it's okay. And I'm just like, excellent. I love this workaround method that you have as a Christian. One thing that I do want to touch on is I really enjoyed like the sense of place that Stacey created. And, you know, she doesn't name landmarks by name, but you can definitely tell if you're from LA, some of the places that they go to, like the beef dip place that um, Lulu takes May is definitely Philippe's, which is a uh, French dip place that's been there since like early 1900s. And then the cake store where May first meets Wallace when she goes to buy the strawberry cream cake is definitely Phoenix Bakery on Broadway because that's what they're known yeah. for. And they still have the strawberry. Cake. Yeah. And it does make me sad when I think about like how, you know, our community today, like it's it's shrinking because of gentrification and yeah. it's like all like a uh, Suahiro cafe, for example, like, like was like an establishment in little Tokyo. <laughs> it's like the oldest uh, Japanese diner there. And they were forced to move because of the landlord being a dick. And I'm glad that they have a new location, but at the same time, I'm like, they're not in little Tokyo anymore. And that fucking sucks. I mean, speaking of transportation displacing people, like the reason that Sweet Hero closed um, their Little Tokyo location was because the landlord hiked the prices because there's a new metro connector in Little Tokyo. And that being there has made that area very, very valuable. And so a lot of like legacy businesses are being priced out um, because the landlords wants to bring in higher paying tenants so you know the more things change the more things stay the same right like we've made zero progress over the last like hundred years at this point well like it also brings up you know like Gemma she's very much like we need to stay in Chinatown like this is our home like if we're not physically here uh, and are like physical like legit residents of Chinatown then how are people going to consider us like real advocates for this community and it's like yeah, in a sense, like, I, I get her point, but also, like, she learns at the end, like, oh, even though we're moving, that means it doesn't mean that we're removing ourselves from the community. We're not traitors. Like, community can, uh, you know, regrow, replant themselves elsewhere. And that's kind of what happened with Chinatown and what has happened with a lot of marginalized communities. I mean, uh <laughs> as things have become more and more gentrified. I think about, like, Koreans, for example. Like, I hardly know a lot of Koreans who still live in K-Town. Like, there might be businesses there, for sure, but, like, a lot of them live in OC or Fullerton or uh, on the outskirts. And it's like, yeah, yeah. I mean, we have started new communities in new neighborhoods and um, we're keeping the spirit alive in in a weird way there's also a class component right like you know oh yeah there's a kind of a joke that like 
Chinese people don't really live in Chinatown anymore in LA. Um, but the fact is, there's still a lot of Chinese people living in Chinatown. They're all just poorer and older. It's interesting reading this book as like a member of like the Chinese diaspora who came to the States in the 80s, right? Because we're, it's a totally different community. Um, and, you know, we settled in SGV, OC. Um, but by and large, we're more middle, upper middle class. And, you know, as opposed to like the, like May and Gemma's family would have come during like the late, late 1800s, during like the gold rush, during the railroad construction. And they're all working class. They're all poor. And it's, a, it's just a different community. These days, when you think of like the Asian American Chinese American diaspora, you don't think about those families. Like the the families that, that are like third, fourth generation are often erased in like current Asian American discourse. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's also an interesting reminder that like Asian American history is all about migration patterns and their migration waves and um, the experiences that, you know, May and Gemma's generation experienced. On one hand, do mirror our own, right? Because there's always a fresh new for second generation, there will always be this conflict of traditional conservative immigrant values versus like American exceptionalism meritocracy or the the illusion of meritocracy. And that has existed for the last century or so, ever since there's been Asians in America. But at the same time, you know, the the world has changed. Uh, But at the same time, at the same time, the world hasn't really changed, right? Because we're still experiencing gentrification, development, pushing out communities of color, communities that are the most vulnerable. And, you know, like... Also the patriarchy, you know, yeah. like them telling daughters like, hey, like you're only good for being, becoming a wife. Like getting a husband is like getting a husband and having babies. That is your sole goal in life. And it's like, why is that the only value that I can bring to my community? That freaking sucks. <laughs> Yeah. And I think that's why um, noir and even neo-noirs are, will always be timeless because there will always be corruption all around us. As long as there is people with agendas, power and capital, there will always be corruption. And uh, I think books like this help us recognize that in the world that we live in today as well. Yeah. This was Stacey Lee's uh, first mystery novel. All the other historical fiction novels, they, you know, they're uh, contemporary, not contemporary, um, more like coming of age stories. They're not, I mean, there's a sense of mystery to them, but it's not straight up crime fiction. <laughs> so I think she did a pretty good job for her uh, first tackle into the genre. Yeah, I really enjoyed it as well. Um, also, there were a lot of murders in LA. So <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, oh, it makes sense that like that there is a murder, a high profile murder in, in LA during this time. Yeah, yeah. and there's a reason why 1930s, 1940s LA is such a prime setting for these types of stories because... It's because our um, police was so incompetent. They never (laughs) freaking followed through on clues and like, you know, obviously like genetics and like DNA testing, that was just like not a thing. So people could get get away with crimes like all the freaking time. So... yeah, um, I guess with that, um, any last thoughts about the book? I think... Personally, I really enjoyed it. Um, I thought it was really well paced. Um, I love the mystery of it. Um, the solution, while not what I expected, was still pretty satisfying at the end. Like you had a really good set piece at the end with the confrontation um, between all, all the parties. Um, I really enjoyed it. I'm really looking forward to um, reading more of Stacey's work in the future. Yeah, yeah. I have Downstairs Girl on my Kindle, so that's probably going to be my... <laughs> I'm going to move that up on my TBR. I enjoyed reading this book. I like the characters. I love books with sister relationships. Maybe it's because I don't have a sister and I've always <laughs> kind of envied that kind of uh, closeness. Uh, I love um, I love this period, the fashion, the uh, just the history of it. It's so rich. It's uh, and also like living in L.A. It's like completely immersive for us to read. Um, I do have some issues with the pacing and like the number of red herrings. But like I said, this is more of like a personal taste kind of thing. And when it comes to like reading crime fiction um, or like noir fiction. Um, But yeah, I really enjoyed it. And I think Stacey Lee has beautiful prose as well. Um, A lot of the sentences, I was like, wow, it's gorgeous. Um, Of course, she's like a veteran writer. So (laughs) so I'm just like, everything just reads seamlessly. (laughs) Yeah. We didn't even talk about the MVP of the book, which is The Mule. I really enjoyed that the um, the family jalopy was also like um, a a major character and like uh, 
a prominent character in a lot of the chapters. Oh, I thought it was, okay, this is like totally random, but I thought it was really funny how they were talking about uh, how the freeway connecting Pasadena to LA, DTLA, has not been built yet. And, and still has not been built yet. Wait, no, yes, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's a royal, it's the Arroyo 110. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like I'm thinking was, of the 710, which is still unfinished to this day. <laughs> But that's no, no, connected no, to no. Like, they were oh, talking about the Arroyo uh, uh, 110 freeway. Yeah, the and I was like, oh, 110. I go on that freeway all the time. And you can <laughs> tell that it was made in like the freaking 50s because um, nothing is updated. It is tiny. It is curvy. Oh, you um, mean the on ramps and off ramps right into residential streets that like are Yeah, yeah, terrifying? yeah. And there's like stop signs too. <laughs> and you have to just like freaking gun and gun it because like people are going like 70 miles per hour on like a 50 mile per hour freeway because cars could only go that fast back then. <laughs> like they have not updated it at all. Yeah. Um, recently they... They did an experiment where they closed that freeway for like a Sunday and allowed people to just like walk across what? it. So I was like, oh, dang, like there are people actually like walking their dogs and their families. Like it's like <laughs> such a wonderful social thing. And I was like, oh, cars have ruined so many things for <laughs> so many things for us. Um, yeah, like I was also thinking like, oh, they're going everywhere. They're going from Chinatown to Beverly Hills to like... Uh, Pasadena to like DTLA I'm just like like how is the traffic how is the like how is the traffic was it as bad back then I don't I was, know I was actually thinking about this when I was driving um to San Gabriel the other day and driving past Baldwin Park which I think was uh one of the settings like man in the book this was all farmland right like where I'm leaving right now Whittier would have been all farmland and <laughs> but urban sprawl has you know has taken over. <laughs> I mean, the yeah. next time I'm in DTLA and I go past Alameda, I'll be like, oh, this is where Stacey Lee's Chinatown takes place. <laughs> <laughs> I guess with that, that'll do it for a discussion of Kill Her Twice um, by Stacey Lee. If you have any thoughts about our discussion or about the book, um, please let us know either on Discord or on our Goodreads um, forums. Um, as always, we'd love to hear your feedback on our discussions as well. I guess before we call it an episode uh mira can you tell us what we are reading for the month of june all right so for the month of june we are reading greta and balden by rebecca k riley and it was picked as a new york times editor's choice and it got a starred review by kirkus review and it says, uh, for fans of Schitt's Creek and Sally Rooney's Normal People, an irresistible and big-hearted international bestseller that follows a brother and sister as they navigate queerness, multiracial identity, and dramas big and small of their entangled, unconventional family, all while flailing their way to love. Sounds messy as hell, and yeah. I freaking love it. Rebecca Riley is a New Zealand author. She is of Maori descent, and uh, I believe that the characters in Greta and Valden are also mixed race uh, Maori and Russian descent. And the book is set in Auckland, so it's been a it's been a while since we read a book by a Pacific Islander descended uh, author. I think the last one was um, the Imaginary Lives of James Ponike, which was by Tina Macaretti. So. Um, yeah, it's been a while. I'm really glad that we are jumping into a more contemporary setting uh, by a Maori author. So very excited to read this with you all. I heard that the characters are very messy, as I said, and you're <laughs> going to cry at their stupidity. Oh, <laughs> That so is what I've heard. So what you're saying is it, it's cringe. Yeah, it, it's cringe. Yeah. <laughs> uh, from what I have heard, but I heard it's fun cringe. Yeah. Like people, like I, I do like reading books where the characters are just floundering at life and <laughs> somehow they they make it through. It, it, it gives a hopeful message to us all. Yeah. Well, looking forward to discussing that with you at the end of the month. And for those of you who are Patreon supporters, um, read along with us on Discord. Um, I'll be setting up a reading schedule again um, to um, discuss this book weekly. So looking forward to engaging with all of you about our book. Um, and if but, people are wondering why I'm not, I haven't joined in the last couple re readathons, it's because I've been traveling and it's been pretty <laughs> hard for me to uh, keep track of the schedule. And also I'm a mood reader. Sometimes I just don't want to read so i read whenever i want but i will do my best to 
to join in on the readathon this time around. This has actually helped me read um, better because before this, uh, there's there has been a couple of months where I literally just binged our book pick like a day or two before discussion, and this uh, this has allowed me to have more time to process what I'm reading, which which is nice too. Uh, I think it definitely helps with. Um, my ability to discuss books better with you as well. So, um, yeah, that's really funny to- because I feel like binge reading helps me <laughs> talk about the book because I feel like reading it all in one sitting helps me uh, get like the full picture of the <laughs> book. I don't, I don't know if that makes sense, but also yeah. I have, I have like bad memory, so um, <laughs> I have to read it like right before we discuss. Sometimes I will read ahead and I will annotate the crap out of the book and have like a gazillion notes in my notebook because that is the only way I will remember anything (laughs) so yeah everyone reads differently Um, I think for me it's just I want to look good in front of our book club members so I need to like take notes like here are some things I want to say so that's where I come from but yeah looking forward to um, checking this book out Um, but with that um, that'll do it for this episode of Books and Boba thank you so much for listening and we'll see you all next time bye everybody bye Thanks for listening to Books and Boba. This podcast was hosted by Marvin Yue and Ri Ryu and edited and produced by Marvin Yue. Follow the book club on Twitter and Instagram by going to at Books and Boba and engage with us on Goodreads on our Goodreads group. You can also check out past episodes of the podcast by going to booksandboba.com and by subscribing to us on your favorite podcast app. Don't forget, you can support Books and Boba and Asian American authors by purchasing books at our bookshop.org account. Check out the link in our show notes and also at booksandboba.com. Books and Boba is a proud member of the Potluck Podcast Collective, a collective of Asian American hosted podcasts featuring unique voices and stories from the Asian diaspora. Learn more about the collective and check out our fellow Potluck shows by visiting the website podcastpotluck.com. Thanks for listening. Brian, did you go to Saturday school as a kid? I sure did. Did you? Totally. Well, at our podcast, Saturday School, we don't teach a language, but we pass along the culture that we do know. And that's Asian American pop culture. Ada's a journalist, and I'm a professor and film festival programmer. We've watched a lot of great Asian American movies, and we want you to watch them too. Come listen to us as we look back at the pioneering films that have led us to today. 